And so let's follow as I read together uh, from uh, Exodus 1.22. He says, so Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born, you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. And a man of the house, now chapter 2, verse 1, a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. So this is how Moses was born. This is the circumstance. You know, it's interesting that, you know, uh, Pharaoh had just made a decree. Because uh, something had happened, the, the, the children of Israel who had moved there uh, a, a number of years prior had now grown. There, this was now like the third generation. They had grown. There were so many of them. And they were doing so well. And uh, the Egyptians were afraid that they would now increase in number and now wipe them out. And so they decided to put them under cruel bondage and servitude and uh, um, they felt that the best way to do this is to ensure that they killed off the male, the for males for the next generation. So Pharaoh said, "Look uh, uh, to the Hebrew midwives: if you find uh, uh, that a child is about to be born and they're male, you just kill him right away. That's infanticide." And so, uh, but the Hebrew women re uh, midwives refused to do that because they feared God and. Uh, they said, well, they gave an excuse to say each time the Hebrew women were so. So when you hear Christians talking about Hebrew women, that's where they got it from that, you know, uh, the, 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 the Hebrew women are so quick. They have short labor and uh, labor. And before you know it, the, ch the, ch the child is born. So they are unable to uh, 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 kill the child. And it, they, they couldn't bring themselves to kill a child that was now um, uh, alive. And so um, Pharaoh decided and told his people, so this is what you're going to do. And you find a male child of the Hebrews, just throw them into the Nile, into the Nile River. And that's what uh, they were doing. So this, is the, uh, this was going on. It was law. Kill the children, throw them into the river. Can you imagine how miserable, how terrible, how wicked that was in that time? And so um, Moses' mother and father... That was when they became engaged. That was when they became married. I'm saying to myself, does anybody actually want to go and get married and have children in that kind of situation? What was wrong with them? Like, what, what are you thinking? This tells me something. That no matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, no matter what's going on at any point in time, if God has a plan, no matter how dark the situation is, no matter how difficult times are, if God, remember it was law for children to be thrown into the river. But no matter how difficult times are, God, when he has a plan, when he wants to do something, he's going to do it anyway. So two people come together to get married and have children at a time like that. It doesn't make any sense, people, does it? It doesn't. It just doesn't really make sense. But the things of God do not always have to make sense. If God is working, he's working beyond our senses in the first place. So you got to understand that, that he's operating in the supernatural. So brings these two people together and they have a child. And I want to start by, you know, establishing the fact we must remember that pharaoh the king of egypt decreed infanticide as we see in um uh, exodus chapter 1 verse 22 he commanded the the king made a decree he commanded that all his people should throw every son that is born of the hebrew people into the nile into the river just throw them in and that's what they, they were doing. But it, uh, it was because Egypt, like I said, was afraid of the growth and potential power of Israel. We see that in verse 9 to 10 of chapter 1. A male Hebrew children were thrown into the Nile River, as, as I've said. And we want to establish that that same kind of contract. Before I go into the contract, I want to establish that if it was not for Moses' mother who hid her child. And I'm still wondering how she did that. But we'll see that a little later as we go in, into the message. So... Um, 
the, the, the same contract of destruction over the life of children that happened in that time also happened in the time of baby Jesus. Remember, when Jesus was born and Herod was told that a king had been born, he became like, whoa, so somebody is going to come and take the throne from me and my children will not be king after me. So there was a contract. Two times in the Bible, we see some very, uh, uh, you know, where kings actually issued a decree for children under the age of two to be killed. And this also happened in the time of baby Jesus. And think about that. That the Holy Spirit's product, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, was, was, was under, uh, was, there was a contract over his life to kill him. And they had to escape to Egypt. Isn't that interesting? That's ironic at the time. All right. Today, there's also a contract out on the lives of the next generation. There's a contract out on the lives of, genera- on the, of the next generation. And as God used Moses' mother, her name was Jochebed. We find her name somewhere else in the scriptures. Her name was Jochebed, and she was used by God to preserve Moses in order for Moses to become the deliverer, as we read much later. Most of you probably, if not all, know the story of Moses. And it's been put into do- all kinds of movies, right? Moses crossing the Red Sea with the children of Israel, and, and Egypt going through all of that painful moment of God bringing their economy down we've heard about all of that those those ancient tales there's many people who don't believe that stuff they say it's just makeup stories and all that archaeologists have discovered certain things in the middle east that point to things that have happened while some have gone there who do not believe and say nothing happened but i want you to know that our faith the christian faith is rooted in faith that's why it's called faith in fact it is the one faith that the bible says we do not walk by the things we see but by the things that we do not see It's interesting. It's amazing. Okay? So there's a contract on the lives of the next generation. There is a contract. And this is where the mothers come in. Because we we titled the message, Hiding the Next Generation. Hiding the Next Generation. There is a responsibility. I don't blame people who homeschool their children. When they see the things that are going on, when they see the tangent on which the world has taken off away from God's principles, away from God's ideals, you begin to wonder, how are we ever going to raise children in our world today? But I want to say, you know, the reality is that the grace of God is more than sufficient. Hallelujah. Yeah. If you make your house an island for the Lord, if you make your house an embassy for the kingdom of God, I tell you, God will not only visit your home, God will reside in your home, like in the home of Obed. Your house should be the ark of God. Our addresses should be God's addresses in the neighborhood. Hallelujah. Our address should be where God parks his vehicle, where God parks his chariots of thunder. So that when we pray, the neighborhood knows that there is something different emanating from that home. When we come out of our houses, there's a radiance upon our lives. I tell you that the Christian must be different. The believer must be different. The believer, it is not possible for us to say we are Christian. Christians and we can impact anything if there's no difference. If we are always sad, always depressed, always struggling, always doing the things that unbelievers do, we are the ones who are carrying around the music of the unbelievers and celebrating them and telling people, hey, come and see. Your life will be a mess because you are following somebody whose life was a mess. I don't care how many millions they have. I don't care whether they drove in gold Royce Royces. Their lives were a mess because they did not lift up Jesus. And as long as you follow them, the demons that are ro- ro- rotating their lives will also come upon you. They may have died and gone, but the demonic spirit, that, do you notice that many people want to commit suicide? When you get to their house, you see the picture of Elvis Presley. You see the picture of all of these people who may have even sang gospel hymns in the church, but you know that many of them, they live depressed. They were always trying to kill themselves. You know the story. Some of the stories were hidden from the press until years later. That is the contract on the generation to kill and to destroy and to maim and as long as that is what you stuff yourself with if you stuff yourself with that kind of music you stuff yourself with that and 9 24 7 that's what you are listening 24 7 that's what you are pushing then you know why so many people are hooked on drugs today because their icons were hooked on drugs I don't care how you like them. I don't care how you love them let me tell you the truth until a generation is hidden from these things <laughs> There's a reason why we don't smoke in our cars we, because we don't want our kids to smoke. There's a reason why we're not doing drugs. We don't want our kids to do drugs. By the way, we don't want to destroy ourselves. But I'm telling you, the life that we have lived 
But when you come into Christ, there's a difference. It's, 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 you give yourself 100% to Christ. or Because if you give yourself 20% to the devil and you give 70%, the devil needs only 20% to mess you up. You say, well, this is poison. Okay, I'm going to take one teaspoon of poison. It will be fine. It's a, it's, it's a cup that says, well, the one teaspoon will mess you up. So that's why there are many Christians who are messed up. Because they feel if I can just take one teaspoon of the devil's. Well, then you have. So they, they, you have to decide where you want to go. Now, when the decision is made, God's grace is available. God's grace is available. So there's today's evil contract and there's today's grace. In Romans chapter 5 verse 20, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace what? There abounds. So if there's trouble in our society, if there's, if, there's, if, there's a, if there's a challenge as to how to move forward in our faith, there's grace. There's grace. If the governments of the world are against the Christian faith, one of our brothers in church told me a few weeks ago, he said, you know, I, I, I don't know why it's the Christian faith that is persecuted the most. Look at it today in Canada. Who do you think the government supports? Every other faith, Islam is actually the one in front. Buddhism, Sikhism, all the others. And I don't have anything against any of them. I'm just telling you, I love the people of all faiths. But this is the point. I am a Christian, I'm a believer, and I follow Jesus Christ. But why is it that Christians are the ones who are mocked in Hollywood more than any other faith? Have you noticed? Why? Why is it that as a Christian, you can't go to parliament and talk about Jesus, you'll be shut down. But the Sikhs have their turban, it's a religious symbol. The Muslims have their hijab, they have everything. Is it, why is Christ the only one that is vilified? Have you ever asked yourself that question? It is because he's a rock of offense. It's because he said, he's the only one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. None of the others could say that. He said, I am the way. It's a claim that is non-challenged. I am the truth. Who could have said that? I am the life. He says, look, I will die on the third day. I will be resurrected. He said, in my name, demons will flee. So there's an evil contract out today, my friend. There's an evil contract out. But there is grace in the name of Jesus. This generation has been now thrown into the Nile River of drugs, of partying, of illicit sex, of alcoholism, of internet porn, of worldly music, of dark themes, of fellowship with demons. You only have to look at some people and you know that they are controlled by something else is not human. Why would somebody go into a room and shoot everybody? Say it's mental health. Okay, I agree. But how did they get there? If you think that there's no Satan, that's the first deceit. And we can't blame everything on the devil, no. But we need to understand. There are demonic things happening out there. I want to say that mothers like Jochebed have the potential of being great deliverers. So we have the river of drugs running through as Pharaoh's people were throwing babies into the Nile. That is why in our high school, in our middle schools, the river of drugs, the river of fentanyl is flowing and people are, are introducing children and telling them, take this, it's good for you. My son told me several times that he's been offered things. By people who are supposed to be friends. Hey, hey, come and try this. Come and try that. They're not even listening to their teachers who have their heads properly screwed on their shoulders and saying, this is not good for you. You have young girls who are alcoholics already at 17. And they think it's cool to drink and drink and drink and fade out. Or get cross-faded. You know what it means to be cross-faded? You get all the drugs in. And you get all the booze in. You tap it up with cigarettes and you are so cross-faded you don't even know who you are anymore. And it's celebrated. Why is cross-fading celebrated for God's sake? You know what's happening? A generation is being slowly wiped out. The enemy hates this continent to the core because it is from this continent we have seen amazing new discoveries that have saved humankind. I'm telling you the truth. And so the enemy does not want to see the next generation survive. There is a contract out on our children. There's a contract out on our children's children. But we, the church, are here to not renegotiate the contract, but to 
tear the paper, the contract to shreds because the Bible tells me that Jesus Christ had nailed it to the cross. Every handwriting against my children, every handwriting against your children, born or unborn, the devil has been put into flight because Jesus Christ nailed it to the tree. Mothers like Jochebed have the potential of being great deliverers, of bringing great hiders. Mothers like Jochebed can save this generation from the damage of today's evil contract. Pastor F, what do you have to say to that? What would you say? You are a mother. I am a father. We've raised children. And I believe that we are still raising them. I told my children, I said, you know what? You are not an adult until you are 21. The government says you are an adult at 18 because they want your taxes, because they want you to vote. But in our own house, I don't need your taxes. I don't need your vote. The rule here is that you are an adult at 21. And they kept the rule. We have one more who is 12, who is going to be 21. So she'll finish up with where I've started. God bless you in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a clap Amen. and clap. Amen. Amen. Mothers, I want you to say something. Mothers in the house, say, I will not sign a contract of the devil for my children. Can we say that? I will not sign a contract from the devil for my children. Because whether we believe it or not, the contract is out for our kids. The contract has been issued for our children. So mothers like Jochebed can save this generation from the damage of today's evil contract. We have a role, we have a responsibility, we have an assignment to save our children. When I say our children, no matter their ages, some of us here have children that are now young adults. Some of us have children that are even married. We are still responsible for saving them. And I will tell you how we can save them. We need to take steps to protect them. Now that my children are teenagers and even above the, the, the teenage age, what I do to save them is that when I see anything that looks unclear or unclean or a display of some attitude, I go to the scripture. I go and look for a scripture and I text it to them. Do you remember the word of God says this? And they read the scripture and they say, yes, the word of God says this, and then they're able to check themselves. That is what we're supposed to do when we have adult children. Mothers especially know those, uh, mothers especially, those who know and love Jesus are a huge asset to the public. It's important that mothers know and love Jesus. How can we do it successfully? If we don't know and love Jesus, it's going to be impossible. I want to say again, it, look, this word of God is perfect. This word of God is true. This word of God is real. It says in that there is nothing new under heaven that is not been written here. So if we need examples, if we need solutions, if we need ideas, if we need um, 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 strategies, just read this, just study this. And God has given us a long time to prepare before we have these children. God has given you a long time to prepare. Now, if we do not prepare before the children start arriving or even prepare as you are nursing your children, then it is our, it is our fault. It is not God's fault. When something happens to our children, it is our fault. So mothers who know and love Jesus are a huge asset because these kind of mothers go on their knees to pray for their children. Mothers were supposed to, no matter the age they are at, whether married or unmarried or a, a, a young adult or a youth or, you know, a whatever it is, a toddler, it is our responsibility to go on our knees and pray to God about our children. And then because they see us following the scriptures, our children will easily follow the word of God. Children follow their parents. So when we're not good examples as mothers, they have nothing good to follow. If it's, you know, the mother that is doing something different, they will definitely, definitely follow whatever the mother does. I know that many times my, my children will, will want to talk to me and they, 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 they meet their dad, first of all. <laughs> I thought my husband was going to say this because he told me he was going to share this. And he'll say, oh, they'll, they'll be looking around, looking for me in the house. And he'll say, oh, why are you looking for your mom? They'll say, oh, I just need to talk to mom. Oh, but I'm here. Talk to me. He say, no, I want to talk to mom. It's mom I want to talk to. And they've done this so many times, ex especially the boys. They will say, it's, it's mom I want to talk to. But can't you discuss it with me? I, I prefer to talk to mom. 
I don't know for what reason. But you know what? They because they observe you. Because there's a way mothers must have mothers must have a connection with their children. No matter what, whether they're at marriageable age or younger, we must have that connection with our children. We must continue to bring our children to Sunday school because that is where we teach the word of God. That is where we share with them. We go deep into the word. And as we've told you, there is nobody, who, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. So it's important that we continue to train up our children, bring them to Sunday school, encourage them to come to Joseph's generation. I love to teach the youth. You know that, you know my passion. I love the women, I love the youth, I love the young adults in, in, this, in this church. And I love to share with them because I don't want to see them making mistakes and the messes that are out there. And by the grace of God, none of our children will end up in the mess that we see outside in the world in Jesus' name. And then encourage our young adults to church events. We have a young adult group in this church. Okay, encourage them. This is summer when they can easily get together. Encourage them to participate. So you can see, as you're training your children, as you're helping them, you're strengthening them, you're encouraging them, you're sharing the scriptures with them, you are affecting the public. Because those children, they replicate whatever the mother or the father does at home. They repeat it. And that is how it now affects the public. So like Moses, those hidden from today's river of death, will lead tomorrow. I want you to say something to your, to your children, no matter what, mothers. Tell them you're going to be great leaders of tomorrow. If you've not started telling them, start telling them. Because that is the purpose why God is shielding them today. There's a reason why God is allowing them, hide them. Why God is allowing, uh, allowing you protect them. There's a reason for it. It's not for nothing. Because they're going to be leaders of tomorrow. So I want you mothers in the house, please, from today, if you've not been saying it, tell your child, call them and say, do you know you're going to be great? Do you know you're going to be a great leader tomorrow? Don't worry where they're going to lead. They might lead in their profession. They might lead in their industry. They might lead at their places of work. Don't worry about that. But just know that God is preparing them to be great leaders for tomorrow. We have some of our children, by the grace of God, some of our youth, some of our young adults, are going to be people like T.D. Jakes. They're going to be, be like Bill Gates. They're going to be even like Chris Pratt. Amen. Who knows that guy? Yes, I love that guy. They're going to be like that because you know what? The movie industry, the music industry cannot steal our children away. Our children are going to stand for Christ. Our youths, our young adults will stand for Christ wherever they go because we're in a very dark world and they will stand for Christ. Mothers, I know it's not easy and I know that, but I know one thing for sure. It is very possible to be a successful mother. I know it is not easy because we are fighting so many odds in this generation. We're fighting so many things. The, 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 the introduction of internet has, you know, affected so many homes badly. You know, it's a good, it's a good product, but it is having a negative effect on many youths. Or it is having a negative effect on many homes. So I know it is not easy, but it is possible. Let's, Jochebed must have had God's grace. We read the story of Jochebed, who the, the Pharaoh said, every child under the age of two must be thrown into the river. And they did it to many children. But Jochebed had God's grace. Assuming you were living in the time of Jochebed. Assuming you were the mother, you were Jochebed. What would you do? The grace that was upon Jochebed is operating in our generation today. The wisdom that was upon Jochebed is operating in our generation today. The anointing that Jochebed had is also operating upon every mother here today. So I want you to tap into that. I want you to tap upon that grace and know that no situation will put you down. No situation can kill your child in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You have God's grace for your race. One thing I'm going to say, mothers, is that you need to take care of yourself. We need to take care of ourselves in order to take care of the next generation. If we're falling sick all the time, it will be impossible to actually take care of our children the way we should. Okay, if we're not in good health all the time, it will be impossible. So we need to take care of ourselves. 
We need, first of all, I've mentioned this before, spiritually, take care of yourself spiritually. You can't do without it. You cannot succeed as you should, as God has planned, as God has written the script, we cannot do it excellently well or succeed well spiritually without the word of God. We need to take care of our health. We need to eat wise, wisely. Let's eat wisely, not filling ourselves with carbs, you know, and um, a lot of uh, things that will weigh us down and will make us fall sick. Take a, take a trip to the spa if you need to go to the spa. I was one person that I was very bad with taking breaks. I was, I, I didn't know how to take a break. So I really want to thank God. That's why fathers in the house, please help the moms. Because moms, some moms are so task oriented. They look at all the tasks ahead of them. Task for the husband, task for the first child, task for the second child, task for the third, sports, school, home, shopping. It's a very busy schedule. It's almost impossible by our, our human, uh, you know, uh, effort alone. That is why we need the support of, of, of the fathers. We need the support of even the children themselves. So I, they helped me so much in saying that, can you please put off your computer and take a break? There was a day recently, my daughter came back. She went out, she met me sitting on the same seat, came back hours later, and I was still sitting on that seat. And she said, mom, have you been sitting on that seat all day? And I had no answer because the answer was yes. <laughs> so I couldn't respond. So, and I realized that she was telling me, take a break. We must learn to take a break. And we have a program coming up July 6th. We're going to thumb, yeah. So if you're a mother here and you've not received that text, talk to me or talk to Michelle and, and uh, she'll tell us about the thumb, yeah, trip. Let's take a break. Let's treat ourselves. Let's just go away from everything that, uh, you know, away from the family a little bit and just let's refresh ourselves and then come back to continue the work. But it's very important that we take care of ourselves. I want to say something else. Don't dwell on the past. This is a big one and it affects mothers a lot. I know the past is brutal, the past, and the devil does not spare us from our past. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ said, I remember your past no more. He said, though your sins are as red as scarlet, you will be as white as snow. Look at the woman that he met that was caught in adultery. And they were trying to stone the woman. He just stooped on his, on his you know, on the ground and bent down and was writing in the, in the sand. And nobody could throw the first stone because Jesus Christ did not condemn the woman. So Jesus Christ is not condemning your, condemning your past. Why are you letting the past condemn you? The past is a big weight. And when you are letting the past affect you all the time, you want to move forward, you are letting the past draw you back, then you cannot achieve your fullest potential. And that's what God wants us to achieve as mothers, to achieve the full potential that he has put into us. So I want to say something. Don't let the past be a weight. Remember your past no more. Another thing I want to say, kick discouragement in the guts and keep hope alive. When, this, when, when the thoughts of discouragement comes from different directions, reject it. Kick it in the guts. Kick it in the Thank you, pastor. Reject it and say, no, this is not my portion. Look, what you say at the time of discouragement matters. When those thoughts come into your mind and they're saying that, oh, you can see that you look fat, uh, you have gained so much weight, you can't even carry yourself, you're always so tired. Mothers, you know how the devil comes, right? You know those thoughts, right? Tell that stupid voice to shut up. And tell that voice, get behind me, Satan. Why do you think Jesus Christ conquered the devil on the mountaintop? He, as the first time when Satan came against him, he had the word. He had the word. All, I would, I would cap it up in a nutshell. All that Jesus Christ told Satan, in, to paraphrase it, is that Satan, get thee behind me. Get out of my life. No way. Get away from my path. And Jesus and, and Satan left him three times and departed for a, for, for a time. So I'm trying to encourage mothers here that when discouragement comes, don't allow dis discouragement get you down. Rise up against it. Be strong against it. Kick it in the guts and keep hope alive. Amen. Jacob had no idea that she was preserving a whole nation by her actions. Mothers, 
the effort you are putting into your children, the words you are speaking into these children, okay? Again, remember I said whether they are young adults, whether they are teenagers, whether they are toddlers, the words and the efforts you make are preserving a whole nation. Because you don't know where that God is going to lift that child up and take that child to places. Okay? You don't know where that child is going to get to. It's later on we're going to find out. So every, every word you speak, every action you take is preserving that child for tomorrow. The next thing I want to say is that mothers, grandmothers, you are still in the game. Grandmothers in the house. My husband counted about four, right? Amen. Woohoo! God bless you. You have a strong role to play. Okay? And mothers in the house, you are still in the game. To, to wrap up this, um, this message, Hebrews 12, 12 to 15 says, and I'm going to read it very quickly. Hebrews 12, 12 to 15 says, Therefore, and this is to the mothers, please listen very carefully to this, and note this scripture, note it, Hebrews 12, 12 to 15, and I read from NIV, it says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Strengthen it. Don't allow yourself to get weaker and weaker. Strengthen yourself. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Mothers, it is our role. It is our responsibility. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. And it doesn't stop there. That scripture says, and to be holy. That means make every effort to be holy. That means God is saying make every plan you can. Make every, you know, put up strategies, put up plans, put up a schedule. Whatever you need to do, do it. To live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Because the Bible says without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Verse 15 says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Mothers, I've seen many homes in North America today that is in serious conflict. Sister against sister, brother against brother, and stuff like that. It should not be in our own homes. In our own homes, mothers, there should be no conflict, there should be no division. There should be no quarreling, there should be no, you know, I go my way, you go your way. Not speaking to one another should not exist in our homes. Let the children love themselves. And mothers, please love your children equally. Love them. You can give the same love to the first child, to the second child, to the third. Love them equally. Because children see these things. I grew up a bit in that environment. I could see the love that was showered on one more than the other. And I grew up with that. And I had to go to God to say, God, help me to love my, fam my father and my mother the way I should love them. Because se separation or segregation or, or differences should not, should not really matter when it comes to parenting. Amen. So love the children equally. Do not let there be, that scripture says in verse 15, that there be no bitter roots growing up to cause trouble and defile many. Bitter roots, when you allow it spring up, it begins to cause trouble and to defile. It begins to cause conflict among our children or cause conflict among siblings. We should not allow those kind of bitter roots to grow up. And the Lord will bless us. The Lord will keep us. The Lord will strengthen us in Jesus' name. Remember, we're talking about hiding the next generation. As you continue to hide your children, as you continue to encourage them in scriptures, as you continue to encourage them to participate in the things of God, the Lord Almighty will bless you as a mother. And you're going to see the, re the result yet from now and even years later in Jesus' name. So happy Mother's Day. Amen. I just want us to bow our head very quickly. And I just want to pray for the mothers in the house. Father, I want to thank you. I bless you, first of all, for your word that you've given to Pastor and I on how we shall hide our children. We magnify your holy name. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Father, I want to thank you because of uh, Jochebed's story in the Bible and how we've learned from her, how she was able to keep her son even in times of difficulty. 
Blessed be your holy name for that, O oh God. We now pray for every mother in the house today that you will strengthen us, you will give us the wisdom, you will give us the knowledge and understanding and the power and the ability to stand on the truth for our family, to stand on the truth for our children, and to stand on the truth for ourselves, and to be able to apply this truth on a daily basis so that the devil will not manipulate our children and, and lead them astray and even steal them away from us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We pray for grace. We pray for a fresh anointing. We pray for a fresh outpouring upon every mother in the house from today and even aspiring mothers in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord.